Uh, I'm going to talk about this bridge girth paper. Uh, this is currently out on the archive. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Gary and Ohad. Gary is here at the conference, and so he will be happy to talk to you about this as well if you have questions. Um, there are their faces if you want to recognize them. I didn't put my face on the slide because here's, here's me. Um, but I'm also happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about this paper, but I'm going to do a little bit of wandering. I'll kind of like survey some nearby things before I get there. So, uh, in fact, the first thing that I'm going to survey is quite far from bridge girth. Um, on my mom's side of my family, I have this uncle who really likes this one song called, it's called Alice's Restaurant, I believe. And it's, um, they'll play it like every Thanksgiving. Uh, Alice's Restaurant is this folk song. Uh, the guy like sings this little chorus and then like tells a story through the verses that's like about how war is bad and American society is corrupt and it's all very funny and wise. Uh, but he has one quote which I think is especially wise in this. Here it is. Okay, so that's Arlo Guthrie. He's the singer. And the quote is this. It is, uh, at the bottom of the cliff, there was another pile of garbage. And we decided that one big pile is better than two little piles. And rather than bring that one up, we decided to throw ours down. And uh, he's making the point, I guess, this like one big pile of garbage is better than two small piles of garbage, which I think like really gets at something deep about the way that we do theoretical computer science. So to, um, to try to like emphasize that, let me show you a bunch of problems in algorithms that are out there. And these are all problems that people work very hard on. Here are some like various state-of-the-art runtimes, or at least for most of their lifetime, these were the state-of-the-art runtimes. And I don't say this to like disparage anyone's work. I say it for the sake of a metaphor. But let me describe all these as like small piles of garbage here. So this is like vaguely horrifying. If I had to tell you about all of these definitions and you had to learn an entirely new set of techniques for all of these and the millions more problems that we study in algorithms, that would be a terrible life. It would just, it would be so, like this avalanche of information that would be really hard to sort through. But algorithms people have done this really good thing, which is take their small piles of garbage and combine them into a few, like, big piles of garbage that make things much easier to understand. So in particular, you don't really have to separately understand traveling salesmen and max clique and graph coloring and the, all the other NP-complete problems. We have like formally proved that there is this one common technical thread that runs between them. You can reduce them all to SAT, they are all NP complete, and in fact, that is provably the best that you can do. Similarly, sort of following in that template, we have these other equivalence classes that we've developed. There's this like equivalence class, which all happens to be strong ETH hard used in fine grained complexity. There's another equivalence class that happens to all be. Uh, hard for the APSP conjecture, and so on. And this is formally sorting problems by the reason that they're hard, making this world a much more tractable, nice place to live. And there's actually, I'm going to claim there's two good things about this method. Number one is that it makes all of these problems just much easier to sort through. The other nice thing about this research strategy is that more so than any other, failures are really useful. It's like in the original NP complete paper, there's this line which is quite funny in hindsight where they're like, we tried very hard to add graph isomorphism to the list of NP complete problems but weren't successful. Uh, this failure wound up being a prophecy. The fact that they failed pointed at the fact that there really was something fundamentally different about graph isomorphism that we just hadn't noticed yet. This was uh, Babai's breakthrough in 2015 where he got graph isomorphism in quasi polynomial time strongly suggesting that this is not, in fact, an NP-complete problem. So this like, pointed the way for future work. This other one, there was a all pairs max flow. Many people were trying to get a fine-grained reduction for this, showing that this long-standing n-cubed time is optimal. Uh, more recently, Abud, Krathkramer, and Tabelzi, and a few other papers as well, have now improved this n-cubed runtime to n squared. So that, too, was kind of a prophecy. That failure showed us what uh, problems were really deserving of our upper bound attention that really had something fundamentally different going on in them than what we had previously understood. So with that in mind, uh, I want to say just like algorithms culture I think is really good. This research area has been designed amazingly well. And here are the nice features. You can either like prove a tight linear time runtime bound for your favorite problem in algorithms and you know that's great, everyone loves that. Or if you don't quite make it there, it's also accepted to show that any further improvement to your runtime would imply progress on one of these canonical hard problems. 
and then everyone is happy that you're, excuse me, everyone is happy that you're stopping there once you do that. So this is great, and it raises the question, what is a good hard problem? A good hard problem, I'm gonna say, mostly has these three features to it. It should be very simple to express. You should be able to sort of read it and understand what this hard problem is asking of you very quickly. It should be expressive. It should be like capturing lots and lots of different diverse problems. And the last feature that's good for hard problems is that there should be a good reason to believe that it's hard. You can't just make up any problem you want and reduce to it. It's really more respected, I guess, if you can say people have worked on this problem one way or another for many years, or there's some sort of conjecture or reason to believe that it's hard to do. That will make your hardest conjecture believable. So this is great. And uh, by now, there are many, many widely accepted hard problems. Any reduction to one of these in algorithms is considered great. You can use that to close a problem. So that's good. Uh, meanwhile, I'm here to talk to you about this research area of network design. And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about it through the lens of extremal problems. So generally speaking, in network design, there's kind of two types of problems that we contend with. Sparsification problems is one. This is the general type of problem where you have like some large input graph, you're trying to sparsify it, remove as many edges as possible while approximately preserving some structural properties, whatever that means. There's another class of problems which I'll call augmentation problems within this. Uh, it's maybe a bit hard to see, but there's some like new red edges being added to the graph in that right picture. It's where you're trying to improve the connectivity properties of a graph or something like that while only adding a small number of edges or making a small number of changes to it. So this is great. Uh, and these contain both algorithmic and extremal problems. To give you an example, spanners, this is kind of a, these have come up over and over again in the talks in these workshop. Uh, the basic definition of a spanner is this. You start with some dense graph. That is, of course, not an amazingly dense graph. It's just an example. And you get some stretch constraint, which is this parameter k in the definition. And you're trying to come up with a sparser subgraph that preserves all pairwise shortest path distances within this factor of k. So there's an input graph. You can kind of safely remove that one edge, which is a win, while only stretching distances by times three. There's two different types of questions that we could ask ourselves about spanners. One is this family of algorithmic problems. For example, one of them might be given an input graph. Find me the sparsest possible two spanner of that input graph. That is an example of an algorithmic problem. We have this great language in which to talk about algorithmic problems. That's been my point so far. We can say that like order log n approximation to algorithms are known. This has been proven to be tight using some PCP machinery, assuming that P is not equal to NP. So we know exactly what garbage pile to throw this one on, and then we can say that we're done. This is basically closed. Uh, meanwhile, there are extremal problems. An example of an extremal problem in spanners is how many edges do you need at most, in the very worst case, for an eight spanner, for example, of an n node graph? So it turns out that n to the five over four edges always suffice, and we don't know whether or not this is tight. And the point that I want to make here is that NP completeness or any of these other problems that you might be used to as hard problems fundamentally cannot help you here. All of those problems, they say something about algorithmic runtime. You are not going to prove that like, that bound is tight unless p equals np or something like that. That's just not what the conjecture is good for. So the point that I'm trying to make with this is that we need different sets of hard problems in order to attack extremal problems. This great toolkit that we built for algorithms maybe like points the way and gives us a method to try to follow, but it's not going to be the right stable of hard problems for this type of thing. OK, good. So here is a bunch of problems in network design. Maybe you recognize some of them. I'm not going to define these, but I just want you to be like vaguely horrified at this slide. Like if I were to try to define these for the rest of the talk, that would be all that I did, basically. Uh, and the point that I want to make is that one nice thing is that you don't quite have to define all of these individually and approach them all individually. In particular, uh, there is one extremal hard problem that plays the role of NP completeness or whatever that is widely used in network design. That problem is the girth problem. So here's the definition. As a reminder, the girth of a graph is the number of edges in its shortest cycle. And gamma nk, that right there, that is the extremal function of high girth graphs. So what that means is that gamma nk stands for the integer that is the maximum possible number of edges that you can pack into an n-node graph 
Well, maintaining that its growth is greater than k. You're not allowed to complete any cycles of length k or less as you add these edges. To give a quick example, this graph, it's kind of famous in graph theory, it's called the Peterson graph. This turns out to be the most number of edges that you can pack into a 10-node graph without completing any cycles of length three or four. It has 15 edges, therefore gamma 10 comma four equals 15. So that's what this function is doing for us. Uh, and this, uh, determining the value of this function gamma, even asymptotically, even up to constants, in fact, even up to polynomials, this in some form, which I'll make precise in a bit, this was asked as an open problem by Erdos in 1963, and we have virtually no progress on it whatsoever since then. So I can pretty convincingly say that this is a good hard problem. You know, Erdos conjectures are supposed to be scary, and I'm using that to my advantage here. Uh, we at least have a good reason to believe that like, it would be a breakthrough to make further progress on this. So this hard problem, uh, this is kind of the basis. Uh, sorry, first let me, let me mention this. So uh, this hard problem, you can sort of talk about how many edges do you need in general for a multiplicative spanner of an end node graph? You can separately ask uh, what is the value of gamma n k? And this famous paper in network designed by Althofer, Das, Dobkin, Joseph, and Suarez from 93, it showed this exactly tight reduction between these two functions. It said that figuring out the value of ms n k, in other words, the number of edges you need in the worst case for one of these multiplicative spanners, this is the same problem as figuring out gamma. I'm not saying that these are exactly the same function. There's this like small difference where a k becomes a k plus one. And in general, these reductions can take on even larger differences than that. But the point is just that like one function determines the other. If you know the value of one, you know the value of the other. So this is great. Like we can sort of, this is our, our one garbage pile that we have in network design and we're very proud of it. It's, uh, it's very powerful and good. It's a big hammer. So spanners can be reduced to this, emulators and distance oracles and many other problems which are sort of generalizations of spanners in some way. Uh, they can also be reduced to this same gamma function. And so even though we don't know the value of how many edges are needed for a spanner technically, despite that, Spanners are considered closed from this perspective in the same way that traveling salesman is considered closed. We know exactly what problem it belongs to. Okay, so that's what we have. Um, in fact, this garbage pile can be expanded slightly uh, as follows. So there's a generalization of the girth problem called the bipartite girth problem. So the bipartite girth problem, now we're gonna talk about this function double gamma, 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 and pk. And what that means is it's the max possible number of edges you can pack into this bipartite graph that has n nodes on one side, p nodes on the other side, and girth greater than k. So now we care about the number of nodes on each side of the bipartite graph. So there's an example. That is a bipartite graph. Its nodes have been colored red and blue. There's seven of each. It is the densest possible graph. That is a seven by seven bipartite graph of girth greater than four. It has 21 edges, and so it sets the value of gamma gamut there. So one nice fact is that uh, it's a folklore theorem that gamma gamma n comma n comma k, the case where we're talking about balanced bipartite graphs, this is in fact the same as up to constant factors as gamma n comma k. So in other words, this double gamma function in fact generalizes gamma. Anything that you can reduce to gamma, you can reduce to a special case of gamma gamma. And so we might as well make this the basis of our hard problem. It turns out that the extra expressiveness that we get is useful in a serious way. So what is that? Um, here's the special case of the, we sort of like added a couple of items here. We can get these like fight, fault tolerance and communication complexity variants of spanners and emulators and friends. And kind of the, the killer application of generalizing to gamma gamma is that we also get the Ruja Zemmeretti problem as a special case. So Sepper talked about this for an entire tutorial, and he did a much better job than I will about explaining what this problem is and what it's good for. But this notation here, this RS of n, this is uh, roughly the same as the notation that Sepper was using. What it means is it's the maximum number of edges that you can pack into an n node graph whose edge set can be partitioned into n induced matchings. So that's RS n comma n. Uh, it is equivalent, so it's equivalent to this like, a uh, special case of gamma, of gamma gamma here. Uh, this, I think, is, there's, there's all these applications. Sepper talked about some of them, of the Ruge Zemmeretti problem specifically. But I think that, like, this connection is, should, is something that people should know about, I guess. What it's saying is that gamma gamma is this function that smoothly interpolates between the girth problem, which is famous, 
and the Rouge's M ready problem, which, which is famous. And now this is like the common generalization of the two. Uh, this equivalence, by the way, was proved in this paper by DeCon and Zekely from 1991. I don't think a lot of people know about this paper, but I think that they should. This is a very underrated paper from the past. So shouting that out there. Um, so this is good. We've made some progress, but there's still all this other stuff to be vaguely horrified by over there on the right. And so what we're going to do here, this talk is going to be trying to develop a few new hard problems to add to our stable that will catch some of these other still lingering problems off to the side. OK, good. So we have the bipartite growth problems. We want more simple, expressive, hard problems to work with. And the basic view that we're going to take in this paper is we need a reason why the bipartite. Is there a question? Hi. Uh, it is n to the 2 minus little o of 1, and what that little o of 1 so thing is. Oh, I see. Um, so it's a little bit hard to answer that directly, but roughly speaking, it's when p is very large, like almost n squared, but not quite. That's the case where it corresponds to Rush's M already. Good. So, uh, anyways, so the bipartite growth problem, we need like an explanation for why it doesn't capture the problems that it doesn't capture. And the basic view that we're going to take is that the bipartite growth problem is this fundamentally undirected thing. It's talking about undirected graphs and bipartite growth of those graphs. And I'm going to say that the case where it fails is sort of an undirected versus directed problem. And I'll make precise what I mean by that in a moment. And it's a bit more complicated than just starting to talk about bipartite growth of directed graphs. That would sort of still not be expressive enough. You could have very dense uh, bipartite graphs where all of the edges are just directed from one side to the other so you don't get cycles. So what I'm going to try to set up next is I'm going to tell you about this other problem that I would view as the natural directed version of the bipartite growth problem. So let me try to set that up. So first of all, I mean, it's going to be a few steps, a few definitions to get there. The first one is this. The first one is set system girth. So a set system is this sort of hypergraph-like object where you have a collection of nodes and a collection of sets of those nodes. Uh, for example, here is a set system that has six nodes and four sets. And you can speak about k cycles living inside set systems. For example, you can see there's like a four a uh, four cycle right there inside this set system. So there's the formal definition of what it means to be a K cycle, but it's really intuitive. A, a cycle is exactly what you would expect it to be in one of these. Uh, this, because its smallest cycle has length four, we would say that this set system has girth four. And the nice thing about this is that set system girth is nothing more than a rephrasing of the bipartite girth problem. These are the same. So what I mean by that is gamma gamma is this extremal function of high growth bipartite graphs that we talked about earlier. We could then define sigma NPK as being the maximum sum of set sizes that you could pack into a set system while avoiding short cycles. And one second. Uh, the theorem, which is folklore, is just that these two are basically capturing the same information up to this factor of two in the parameter. I will show you a picture of that in a second. Let me take questions. I see a couple hands. Can you move up one second? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to understand why the, uh, so, so are your sets, do you also assume that your sets are sort of, like the set system is closed <coughs> after taking uh, intuitions or something? These, it seems like the k-cycle system relies on sets of size 2. Yes. So a k-cycle is any time I can sort of delete some sets from the system and maybe delete some nodes from those sets and wind up with this subsystem that I get after these deletions. Oh that just contains these parts of size two that form a cycle. Good, that definition clear? Other questions so far? Good. Okay, so these two functions, I'm claiming that they're the same. One is just a rephrasing of the other. To very quickly just put the, the proof up there, uh, you can basically translate between set systems and bipartite graphs by taking what is known as the incidence graph. So here we have this set system that I just put up that has girth four. It has one, two, three, four sets in it and six nodes. We translate that to a bipartite graph where there's six nodes on the left corresponding to these and four sets on the right corresponding to these. And edges are used to indicate set membership. We put an edge from a node to a set if in the original set system that node is contained in that set. 
So these capture the same information, and you can kind of check that any cycle on the left corresponds to a cycle of twice that length on the right. For example, this four cycle will correspond to this zigzagging eight cycle there that includes all four nodes and all four sets that participate in the original cycle. So these are the same, but the reason why it is helpful for the sake of this talk to move from bipartite girth to set system girth is because now we can speak about path systems. Path systems are just the natural directed version of set systems. It's just like a set system, but there's also a total order equips on each set. So every set just has an order of its uh, vertices that it contains instead of just being an unordered set of vertices. So there's a path system. Uh, it's kind of defined how you would hope. Here's a sample path system. It has six nodes and four paths once again. And let's just like take a moment to philosophically ask ourselves how should we go about defining the girth of a set system, or the path system rather. So this is a little bit tricky for the reason that the first attempt that you make at defining girth doesn't actually quite work as you might hope. So in, first of all, in order to define girth, we need to like, just like talk about what it should mean to be a cycle in one of these systems. So here's a first attempt at defining girth, which is gonna be a failure. It's, this is not the one that we're ultimately going to use. If you have a path system, we could say that like a k-directed cycle in this path system is when you have subpaths of length two that are sort of arranged in a directed cycle like this, possibly with a few nodes between them. It doesn't need to be like a contiguous cycle or anything like that. But you could define that and say like, okay, let's, let's try to talk about a directed, uh, the directed girth of path systems. Does anybody see what might go wrong with this? Why this is not a good definition to proceed with? Sorry, what's that? Uh, so every individual set is allowed to be equipped with its own ordering, if you like. But uh, what you are saying there is sort of getting at exactly the reason why this is not a good uh, version of girth to use. For example, let's return to this thing right here. This is what I would call an acyclic path system. It turns out that all of the path systems are kind of alphabetically, all of the paths in this system are alphabetically ordered here. And that would mean that it has directed cycle girth infinity or something like that. It has no directed cycles in it. And the issue with this definition is that an acyclic path system can be basically arbitrarily dense and still completely avoid all directed cycles as long as you just make sure that all of the paths are going in the same direction through the nodes. So although this is well defined, there is not going to be an interesting extremal function attached to this that we could use in order to prove reductions. That's also sort of true for normal directed thrash, right? There yes. So it's acyclic a, is pretty dense. Yes, it's exactly. Nice, not a nice Analogy. Why, why do you want to generalize the paths? It's not to be done. To. So why are we talking about path systems instead of arbitrary directed why graphs? Why do you want uh, acyclic not to be dense? Well, in directed graphs, it's fine if it's acyclic and dense. Ah, so what I want here, what I'm trying to get at is I'd like to define some sort of girth notion for these path systems with the property that any high girth path system needs to be small in some way. If I don't define something with those properties, it's going to be very hard to use that as a hard problem for reductions. So the reason why I'm not going to use this directed cycle definition is just that like, it doesn't really work out in that sense. So there's no good extremal function attached to this. High directed girth path systems can be arbitrarily large. So instead, let's like return to the drawing board for a moment and see exactly what it is that we're trying to generalize here. So if you kind of dig into the structure of these bipartite girth reductions, a lot of them have something like the following technical piece going on in them. That technical piece, uh, for example, for spanners, they will say, okay, if there's a short cycle, then there's some kind of redundancy in play. Like this blue edge here, if we're only trying to build a three spanner and three approximations to distance suffice, then we don't really need to keep that blue edge around in our spanner because there's already a very good path going around it. So this is roughly how reductions work. And with that in mind, that gives us some intuition that the directed thing that we should be looking for looks more like this. So in other words, 
the key property that makes these reductions work is that for some special edge, the rest of the cycle defines an alternate path around it. So this is the picture that we're going to focus on here. That is the structure where this edge has this three path going around the other side. So this I'm going to call a bridge. So this is the like, new technical definition. This is the paper title is bridge girth. That's where this is coming from. So it's sort of exactly like a directed cycle, but with this one special edge or like path having reverse direction to the rest of it. There's a two bridge. Uh, we're giving this lower special reversed edge the name of a river, and the other ones are arcs. Uh, the place where this word came from is that we were like drawing pictures on the board one day. We were like, what should we call the special edge? And someone said, it's called a river for now, but we'll come up with a different name later. And uh, something that I've learned is that that never works. Like you're stuck with the first name that you come up with in all research projects. So anyways, uh, this is the thing that we're going to focus on, these bridges. And with that in mind, the key definition that we're going to use for path systems is bridge girth. So bridge girth is this. Here's this path system that we were talking about before. I will point out, first of all, that this path system does not contain any two bridges. You can kind of quickly check that if you inspect any two of these paths, they only intersect on one node. And that's enough to verify that it doesn't contain a two bridge. Two bridge comes when you have two paths that intersect on two nodes, and in fact, they use them in the same order. So that's good. Uh, this path system does contain many different three bridges, however. Those three circled nodes are one of them. So if you look at like the yellow path, that's the first arc of the three bridge. The green path, that's the second arc of the three bridge. And then the red path, that's the river of the three bridge that I'm pointing at here. Uh, one quick thing to point out is the river is sort of skipping over this node in the middle, and that's allowed. When we speak about a path system containing a bridge, we don't mean that it contains a bridge as contiguous subpaths. We mean that it contains a bridge sort of jumping across its paths in any way you might like. OK, so because it has no two bridges and it does have a three bridge, we would say that the bridge girth of that particular path system right there is three. Question? Sorry, when you're like counting your arcs, is a, an arc is like a monochromatic subpath, or an arc is like literally an arc in the correspondence? It's a monochromatic subpath. Yes, so arcs, even if there was like many nodes on the yellow path between those, it would still be a three bridge. And, and ditto for the river. Cool. That's same for the river. Okay. Yeah, there can be many nodes between. Yeah, thanks. Good, good clarification. Other questions on this definition? How am I doing on time, by the way? Fifteen minutes. Okay, I might skip some stuff. But uh, question, yes. Um, your definition says by not necessarily contiguous subpaths, uh, but the, all the examples you've given so far have contiguous subpaths. Right? Uh, so this one. The river right there is not a contiguous subpath. We're sort of taking the subpath that goes this bottom node A to this top node E, but skipping over this you node C. You just mean like ignore the sort of degree to in between nodes. That's, that's what you mean. Uh, yes, essentially. So like you can imagine that if there's just sort of some floating vertices in the middle of one of these bridges, that's completely allowed. It still counts as a bridge. Yes? Um, what is the, if I took like, end nodes here and end nodes here, and I just put a path of like one from everything on the left to everything on the right, what would the density of that be in this kind of the way we're counting here? Uh, good. So if you had a, to the question, if you sort of had end nodes on the left, end nodes on the right, and then sort of one path between all pairs, that would have density n squared. That would have n squared size. But it would also have n squared paths, because you would need to make each of these individual edges its own path in order for that structure to work. So what you're pointing out, which is absolutely true, is that the extremal function of bridge girth when you have n nodes and n squared paths is going to be n squared. Okay. Yes? So direct, directed cycle will have an infinite bridge girth. Cycle. Yes, good. So directed cycle has as large bridge girth as you want. Still good so far? This is an important definition. This is kind of the crux of the talk. So it's, questions are good here. I want to make sure we're on the same page. Oh, there can be more nodes of the R. Yep. Um, so why isn't the three river also a two river? You can like forget the middle node. Uh, this part right here. Uh, the R, not the river. Oh uh, yeah. So this yellow part, for example. Uh, yeah. You know there could be other nodes on it, right? Yep. Absolutely. So now I'm saying, why don't you forget the opposite kind of node and then treat it as a two? Forget. Uh, we usually forget the opposite node. Uh, the middle, the circle node. 
this circle node right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this circle node is sort of the one that is connecting the two arcs right here. This yeah. bridge is formed from the yellow arc and the green arc, and so you sort of have to consider this node to be the node that's in common, where these two arcs intersect each other. But you told that on the arc there could be other vertices. Yeah, so totally. you could have like a few other vertices on this yellow arc right here, and they would just not really participate in the bridge at all. The bridge, we would just sort of forget those vertices for the sake of viewing that as a three bridge. Yes? Is it, does the river only um, include sort of one set or, or one sequence, or can it be like, I don't know, like two different directed paths that like here? Good, path. yes. So the river absolutely must be just one path. The, the arcs can sort of be a bunch of different paths, but the river needs to be all contained in one single monochromatic path in this picture. Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling for the sake of time. I hope that we're uh, okay so far. But this is the definition that we're gonna talk about. Meanwhile, this system has bridge girth three. We're gonna speak about the size of these path systems, just to clarify what I mean by that. It's like the sum of the number of nodes along paths. This thing has four paths of three nodes each, so we'll say that its size is 12. And uh, beta NPK, that is the extremal function of path systems that have N nodes, P paths, and bridge girth greater than K. So that is the new thing that we're going to discuss. It turns out that this particular path system that we're talking about here is the largest possible path system that avoids, that has uh, specifically six nodes, four paths, and avoids two bridges. It has size 12. That tells you that beta 6, 4, 2 equals 12. So this is the function that we're speaking of here, this bridge growth function. And uh, quick note, k equals infinity is going to be a very important case that we talk about. That just means you're not allowed bridges of any size whatsoever. Okay, so here is the picture as we left it a moment ago. We were kind of trying to consolidate all of these problems off to the right. Uh, here is what, not even all of bridge growth, here's what beta NP infinity does. It does this, turns out. So specifically, we get like reachability preservers and pairwise path oracles. These are two problems that have been studied before that turn out to be just exactly beta NP infinity. We have type reductions going in both ways that we show in this paper. So you now don't have to like think about those problems anymore. You can just sort of know that you can completely understand what's going on technically by just understanding what's up with beta NP infinity specifically. One second, that'll take a question. These things over here, these are notable problems that have one-way reductions, sort of in the sense that graph isomorphism did before. We're able to either reduce the upper or the lower bound. I guess all these are lower bounds, actually. But we're able to recover the current state of the art lower bound by just doing some reduction to beta NP infinity and then plugging in whatever is known about beta NP infinity. Um, but there, we don't have a corresponding upper bound thing, which is why there's some no, new upper bound boxes that are still living outside all of this. Uh, the other really nice thing about bridge girth is that it also captures the Ruch's Emeretti problem in the extreme case. So that's kind of nice to have. Like if you believe that the Ruch's Emeretti problem is hard, which you should, all the bounds that we know for bridge girth are sort of natural extensions of the Ruch's Emeretti problem. And so that's sort of some of the basis on which we can say determining beta is a little bit hard. And this is a reasonable conjecture to talk about. Question? Yes? Uh, what does soda mean? Uh, state of the art, sorry. That's an acronym for state of the art. Good. So this is what beta NP infinity does. Um, I have sort of a, a talk through of reachability preservers. Maybe I should give you the definition, but kind of skip over most of the proof. Um, actually, maybe I'll do this one and then skip the next few. So directed Steiner forest, this is me setting up what reachability preservers are, what this reduction is doing. Directed Steiner forest is this kind of famous problem where the input that you get is some kind of graph with these demand pairs, which here are color coded. There's like a red pair, a blue pair, and a yellow pair. And the goal is to come up with some subgraph that preserves reachability among all the given demand pairs that is as small or low cost or sparse as possible. So there's an algorithmic version of this, which is just compute the smallest possible subgraph. That's directed Steiner for us. It's one of the original NP complete problems. We know what's going on with that. There is also an extremal version of this problem, which is if I give you an input system that has n nodes and p demand pairs, how many edges do you need at most to get one of these directed Steiner forests? So that's the extremal version. In this context, the directed Steiner forest is sometimes called a reachability preserver instead of a directed Steiner forest. Those mean the same thing, essentially. And for this extremal problem, uh, we can then define this rp n comma p function. That's just like how many edges do you need at most for a reachability preserver of p demand pairs in an n node graph. 
And the theorem that we have is that this is just the same as beta NP infinity, it turns out. So I think I'm going to skip the proof. Here's the lower bound. It's actually extremely simple. You just sort of take a beta NP infinity lower bound system, interpret it as a graph instead of demand pairs, and argue that you kind of just have to keep everything in a reachability preserver. Skipping through that. Uh, the upper bound is kind of where the interesting part is happening. If you think a little bit about whether or not you can easily reverse that direct, that reduction, you run into troubles because it could be that like there's two separate paths that you could take for an instance or perhaps the paths that you need to take for two demand pairs overlap a lot and therefore they would form a two bridge on the part going between them. And that kind of mostly spoils the reduction you would hope for. Most of the technical work that we do is proving this independence lemma, we call it, which is showing that there exists some particular instances of realizing RPNP that avoid these problematic cases. Sort of a funny thing to do reduction-wise. It's like instead of handling all input instances, we're just like some of these input instances are not the worst ones, and then we get our reduction on the worst ones. Okay, being very quick about that. Uh, another problem that we do is uh, the directed flow cut gap. This is another one of the things that is captured by beta NP infinity. So to see what that is quickly, uh, min cut max flow, everybody knows this. If you have a single demand pair, the min cut between that demand pair is equal to the max flow between that demand pair. You can also ask about min cut max flow problems with many demand pairs, not just one. And here, the min cut is still well defined. It's like the cut that disconnects all demand pairs. The max flow is still well defined. It's like the maximum flow you can get pushing flow between all of your demand pairs at the same time. And it turns out that in this multi-pair setting, min cut is still larger than max flow, but they are no longer necessarily equal still. This spoils equality. However, there is a famous theorem by Leighton and Rao from 88 that says that the gap between these is at most a multiplicative order log n. That's for undirected graphs. You can ask what happens for directed graphs. Can you prove a similar thing? Turns out you cannot prove a similar thing. For directed graphs in 2007, there's this great paper by Chizoy and Kana where they construct these very particular instances that get a gap of about n to the 1 over 7. So a small polynomial, but nobody is quite sure what that polynomial, that, what that polynomial should be. That's the state-of-the-art lower bound. The state-of-the-art upper bound on the directed flow cut gap is considerably higher. What we can do here is show this thing. So this looks a little bit gross at first glance, perhaps. But the only thing that you need to care about in this is that we have taken this directed flow cut gap function and expressed it in terms of beta n n infinity, the special case of beta n p infinity. So once we have this in our pocket, this reduction, it turns out that if you were to just plug in the state of the art lower bounds for beta n n infinity, you would recover the lower bound of n to the 1 over 7. And if someday in the future someone comes along and improves these beta n n infinity lower bounds, that would, in a black box way, improve the directed flow cut gap. Yes? That theorem statement. So that that's how the wrong to spin it, right? So oh, so so the, so then what is the function of a directed gap? DFG. DFG is supposed to be the flow cut gap here. So like that theorem up there is like saying that DFG of n is at least n to the one over seven. I see. So you are using bad time. I see. Okay. Yes. So but this bound, even the best possible bounds for beta, how large? Suppose I get the best current upper bound for beta here, what will I get? Uh, I don't remember the exact function, but it's close to like end of the one fourth or end of the one third, somewhere around there. But it's still very far from the current upper bound. That's which are around the square root of n. Uh, yeah, the current upper bound is slightly below square root n. So that's actually the current upper bound. It's in the 11 23rds, it turns out, for this quantity. And do you think from upper bound side also this beta captures the problem? That's a great question. That is exactly that open problem right there, trying to get the upper bounds through some sort of reduction. We have not succeeded in this. Optimistically, that is a prophecy for what should happen next. But uh, that's a bit of wishful thinking on my part, perhaps. OK, so we keep rolling. Um, just to, to at least you know, point at a few other things. Uh, this is all what's happening with beta NP infinity. We get all that stuff down. The other case, I'm mostly going to skip over this, beta NP2 also does some stuff. Turns out that beta NP2 gets a few problems as well that have been looked at in the literature. So those are the two main ones. Uh, the intermediate values of bridge growth between 2 and infinity actually don't quite do as much as you might hope from the standpoint of reductions. That's kind of one of the open questions is can you, what can you do with those? They do turn out to be very helpful to talk about when we speak about the actual quantitative bounds on beta, which I'll mention very quickly in a minute. 
Okay, uh, this is the beta NP2 stuff. I'm going to skip it. Um, the last thing that I want to mention here is there is another hard problem that is just a slight variant of bridge girth that turns out to be helpful as well. This is ordered bridge girth. So we can also speak about ordered path systems. These are path systems that have a total order of their paths. It's like the paths in the system are arriving one at a time. And the constraints now is just that you cannot ever complete a short bridge by adding the river last. So this is a more relaxed thing. We're not forbidding all short bridges. We're only forbidding bridges, short bridges in which the river comes last in the ordering. And uh, with this in mind, we can then talk about the ordered bridge girth of a system, and we can talk about beta star NPK, which is this modified extremal function of ordered bridge girth. This tweaked problem turns out gets some even more stuff. So that's now the picture with this tweaked problem in play. Uh, I won't really talk about any of those too much. The last, or almost last thing that I want to mention is uh, the most of the open problems that are interesting from the standpoint of reductions are either get new problems in or take some of these problems where we've gotten like a partial one-way state of the art reduction but we haven't gotten the other side and try to improve those. And this has sort of acted as a signal towards the problems that could be improved in the way that we might hope. In particular, going back here, uh, shortcut sets and exact hop sets where we have lower bound reductions uh, we, when writing this paper, tried extremely hard to get the upper bound reductions and completely failed in that action. We did not get the upper bound reductions as well. And then later it turned out it was because these lower bounds were wrong. So we turned out, sorry, and they weren't incorrect, but we were then able to sort of like take that as a signal and get some new exact hop set and shortcut set lower bounds that made it so that the bridge girth reductions are no longer state of the art. That kind of acted as we hoped. The failure kind of pointed in a good direction. The other one that I want to mention is that additive spanner lower bounds used to have a one-way state-of-the-art reduction to bridge girth. Then this paper uh, is by Lou Vasilevska williams Wine and Zhu. This paper, technically it came before the bridge girth paper, so it was not phrased in this language. But they were essentially sort of opening the black box of the implicit beta NP infinity reduction and showing that, like, actually the reduction view is not the right one. You can get a substantially better lower bounds by doing something a little bit smarter there. So they kind of used that signal in a nice way as well. Okay, so this is basically the, the state. This is where we stand today is this picture right here. Um, I would be delighted if anyone sort of were, it was able to improve this web of reductions that we have. The last thing that I'm gonna mention in two seconds, we have bounds for beta and beta star. There are many bounds implicit in prior work that we sort of gather together in this picture. There's the graph. We also proved some new ones. The two main new ones that we prove, uh, we're sort of trying to address these basic questions that you could use to yell at us. So uh, the first question that you could ask is, uh, are we talking about a real hierarchy here? I've been sort of emphasizing there's this K parameter that can be anything you want. The larger the K is, ideally the smaller the associated extremal function should be. However, implicit in prior work, the best implicit upper bounds for beta NP infinity were inherited all the way from beta NP3. They only exploited the lack of two and three bridges and nothing more than that. So that's kind of bad. Like implicit in prior work, for all we know, it could be that this entire hierarchy collapses to its third level, basically, and we aren't speaking about something real. So with great technical effort, we were able to prove that this hierarchy does not collapse to its third level. However, open question, does it collapse to its fourth level? I still do not know the answer to that question. I will conjecture that it doesn't, that this is a real thing. But this is a good open question, I think. We proved this kind of weird looking uh, bound on beta NP4, which is new. Uh, the only thing you really need to know about it is that it polynomially surpasses lower bounds known for beta NP3. So it's separating those. And the other nice thing about this web of reductions is A, it implies new upper bounds on beta NP infinity, which is actually an important case in the reductions, just since four needs to be larger than infinity. And uh, the as a consequence of the reduction, this implies a polynomial improvement in the bounds that were known for reachability preservers as well. The last one that I want to mention, which I'll, I'll skip over any sort of proof here, uh, I'm supposed to convince you that these problems are hard. Skipping over the reasons why, there are very good reasons to believe that this problem is hard when the bridge girth parameter is three or higher. Those reasons kind of degenerate in the case k equals two, it turns out. So, uh, in particular, we have fully determined the value of gamma gamma NP2. That is the only case where the value of gamma gamma is known. And since we know that, and we can't, I can't really convince you that beta NP2 is, should be hard to determine, can we determine this? Turns out the answer is yes, we can. So there was implicit upper bounds known before. We we're able to show this new lower bound that matches them. 
So uh, this implies new tight bounds on the size of consistent path systems, it turns out, which are an object that is looked at in network design sometimes. Good. So this is just sort of a little bit of intuition on that proof of beta NP2, but I think I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip over that and just uh, go to this last open question slide and then a wrap-up slide. In my opinion, um, getting new bounds for beta NPK for any K, this should be attainable. This is a, an attainable open question, not out of the... Uh, this, it's a reasonable research project, I think. It won't be easy necessarily, but it is doable. The best open question that I could tell you right here is there's an open question about for what threshold of P do we get beta NP infinity equal to order N? In other words, if you kind of look at what's happening along this horizontal axis here, the upper bound for beta NP4, which is the same as 3, has this intercept right there at P equals square root N, whereas the lower bound intercept is closer to uh, N to the 2 over 3. So trying to figure out what that like, critical strike value of P ought to be, I think this is a very good open problem. Okay, uh, this is just my wrap-up slide. So we got these new hard problems in network design, beta and beta star, and we're trying to convince you that they are worthy hard problems through this network of reduction. Um, interesting future directions. Improve our web of reductions. That would be great. Uh, come up with new extremely hard problems. I'm not claiming that these are supposed to cover the entire space of network design, especially for other kinds of graph sparsifiers. There might be other good ones that you would be in play. Uh, there's, we can like go for new improved quantitative bounds on beta and beta star. Uh, if you were to get a new lower bound on beta NP infinity, I want to say I think that that would be a pretty significant breakthrough if you could do that. Because beta NP infinity lower bounds really lie at the bottom of this web of reductions. You would improve like all of the problems in that previous picture if you were to get new lower bounds. Upper bounds are nice too, but lower bounds are really the most consequential ones. If you can get new upper bounds on any beta NPK, that would be significant, and that's probably a nice attainable open question that I think could be solved in the next few years for sure. Okay. That's all I got. Happy to take questions if I have time, but thanks for your attention. prove some sort of reduction that shrinks the current gap in the shortcut set problem between end of the one-third and end of the one-fourth? Currently, no. We sort of like spoiled the bridge growth reductions with these new lower bounds. Um, that is a great open question. I don't want to rule out the possibility of this happening. I do think that some sort of like good hard problem should be possible to get a reduction there, but I'm not really sure what's going on with respect to bridge growth for that question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it turns out uh, that approximate hot set lower bounds can be recovered from beta star NP infinity, the like ordered variant. I didn't really talk about that in the talk, but yeah, if you want like one plus epsilon hot sets, you get lower bounds out of beta star, it turns out. <laughs> that's right. Secretly, have other garbage piles that you're growing. Where you think it might be a different direction and, and collecting some other problems together. Uh, that, that's a good question. I, what it is. Can still say a secret? Yeah. So, the the short answer is no. I don't have any great ideas. Uh, when I have tried to think about that, I've thought a lot in the direction that Shangyan suggested of like trying to figure out what is the hard problem that would correspond to shortcut sets, for example. Okay. Let's think. Right. 